Hi, everybody. So in today's lecture, what I'd like to do is talk to you about the um, potential of voltage in the electric field due to an electric dipole anywhere in the plane that contains the dipole. So first of all, let's um, go ahead and define our dipole. Um, a dipole is two charges that are equal in magnitude but opposite in sign, separated by some small distance. Now, in this lecture, we'll call the distance in between those two charges L. And let's say that we want to find the electric dipole at some random point um, for these two charges. Now, um, what we're going to do is I'll just call this point P, some point of interest. And you'll notice that unlike when I talked about the dipole before, I'm not putting P um, along an axis of symmetry here. It's just some random point in between the two. Now, what I'd like to do is um, put my origin of my coordinate system right here in between the two charges, right in the middle of the dipole. And then I'll call the vector that points from that origin to the point in question, I'll call that R. Okay. Now, um, you'll notice that if I want to find the electric potential or the electric field at that point, what I would have to do is find the potential or the field um, at point P from each charge. So that's going to be a slightly different vector, okay, for each one. So I'll call, let's see, I'll call the vector for the top charge. I'll call that R1, right? And I'll call the vector for the bottom charge, I'll call that R2. And then, of course, the vector in the middle there is R. Now, um, to make things simple, I'd like to leave everything in terms of R because the um, difference between R, R1, and R2 is going to be small. We're going to assume that our point is relatively far away from the two charges compared to the distance in between them. So we're going to assume, in other words, that R is a lot bigger than L, okay? So if I do a zoom in um, on just the uh, charges, right, here's my positive and negative charge, and then here's my origin right in between. Here's R coming off, here's R1 at a slightly different angle, and here's R2 coming to a slightly different angle. Now they're going to converge, right, later. So there's my vectors, right? And you can see that what's going to happen is because um, this distance right here and the other corresponding distance on the other side to the other charge, that's going to be L over 2. And then what's going to happen is we're going to have a path length difference in between R and R2. Um, so, and the same path length difference in between R and R1. So what happens is, let's drop a little perpendicular here. And we can see that this forms a right triangle here. So this is a right triangle. And then the interior angle of this right triangle I'll call theta. Okay. And so the path length difference between um, R2 and R is going to be this leg of this right triangle. Okay. Now, using some trigonometry, I can say that that path length difference is going to be L over 2 times the cosine of my angle theta. Okay. And so um, R2 is going to be larger than R, which is going to be larger in magnitude than R1. And so how they're all related then would be R1 is equal to R minus L over 2 cosine theta. Because like I said, R1 is going to be smaller, right? And then R2 would be equal to R plus L over 2 times cosine of theta, okay? Because R2 is going to be a little bit larger. Now what we're going to do is we're going to deal with finding the electric potential or voltage, right? And um, I'm going to go with the same uh, language that they use in Purcell and Morin, Morin, the same symbolism that they use in that textbook. And I'm going to say that the electric potential, I'll call that phi. And so I'm going to find the electric potential at my point P in question. Now remember that the electric potential due to a point charge um, is kq over r, where k is your Coulomb constant, right? 8.99 times 10 to the ninth in SI units. And so if I write the electric potential at point P, that's going to be the sum of the potential due to plus q and minus q, okay? Now, um, 
now um, plus Q is the top one and the vector for that one is R1. So plugging in, I'm going to call that K plus Q over R1, which is R minus L over 2 cosine of theta. And then um, the other charge is a negative charge, so that's minus KQ over, and then that's going to be R2, which is R plus L over 2 cosine of theta. Okay? All right. Now the next step that I'm going to do is I'm going to um, factor out my R from this, okay? And if I do that, then I get my potential at point P is KQ over R. And now I'm factoring out an R from the denominator. So that's one minus L over two R cosine of theta, right? And then minus one over one plus L over two R cosine of theta. Okay, so that's what I have there. All right, now, um, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, what we're doing is we're assuming that the distance in between the charges is much smaller than the distance to the point in question here, okay? So we're going to assume that L over two is much, much smaller than R in magnitude, okay? Now I'm gonna call uh, this factor, L over two R cosine of theta, I'm gonna call it epsilon. And epsilon is just gonna be some little tiny number, okay? So plugging in for that, um, what I get then is one minus L over two R cosine of theta would then be equal to uh, one minus epsilon, like so. All right, so then um, what we would get is we have in our denominators, right? We have one plus epsilon, right? To the minus one power. And we also have one minus epsilon to the minus one power, okay? So these are the factors in the parenthesis, right? And here we'd have phi P is equal to KQ over R, right? Times uh, one minus epsilon to the minus one plus, uh, I'm sorry, minus right? One plus epsilon to the minus one. So that's what we've got. Okay. Um, you should think when you see epsilons and powers and expansions, you should think, okay, here comes my Taylor series expansion, right? <laughs> so we're going to use the Taylor series expansion to express one minus epsilon and one plus epsilon here to the minus one power. So the Taylor series expansion that we have for one plus epsilon to the minus one, that's gonna be one minus epsilon plus epsilon squared minus epsilon cubed plus epsilon to the fourth and then it just keeps going. That's the pattern. Okay, now one minus epsilon to the minus one power is going to give us one, and that's gonna be minus a minus epsilon, right? And then plus minus epsilon squared minus minus epsilon cubed plus minus epsilon to the fourth power and then so on and so forth, okay? So this ends up being one plus epsilon plus epsilon squared, plus epsilon cubed, plus epsilon to the fourth, okay? Okay, so I think you can see what's gonna come, right? That would mean that my phi P here is KQ over R, right? And then we have the one minus epsilon to the minus one power first. So that's one plus epsilon, plus epsilon squared, plus epsilon cubed, plus epsilon to the fourth, right? Dot, 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 minus one minus epsilon, plus epsilon squared, minus epsilon cubed, plus epsilon to the fourth, dot, dot, dot. Okay, there we go. 
Okay, so the terms that match in this first and second um, parentheses here are going to cancel out. So the one cancels out, right? And the uh, epsilon squared cancels out. So all the like terms cancel out, all the even powers, in other words, cancel out. And this just leaves us with KQ over R, right? And then what's not gonna can cancel is here you have epsilon, right? And then minus, minus epsilon. So that gives us two epsilon plus, and then of course it would be two epsilon cubed, and then so on and so forth. So those are the terms that would survive. But now the deal is that um, epsilon is already a tiny little number. And so if you cube it, it's gonna be even tinier. So that means that all the higher order terms go to zero and we end up with our potential is just approximately KQ over R times two epsilon. Okay. Okay. So now I can plug back in for phi p um, and my epsilon there, remember, was um, L over 2R cosine of theta. So I have Q, KQ over R times 2 times L over 2R cosine of theta. And so my 2's cancel out and I end up with KQL over R squared times cosine of theta. I hope my handwriting is somewhat legible for you there. KQ L over R squared cosine of theta. So that's my potential at point P, okay? Now let's remember um, the definition of the electric dipole moment, okay? So here, let's recopy this over. This is um, KQ L over R squared cosine of theta. That was our solution for our potential. But now we have our dipole moment. Remember in our dipole moment would be the magnitude of um, either charge, the magnitude of either charge times the vector, right? Um, L in between those charges. All right, so the magnitude of P then, which I'll just call P, little P, is Q, Q L. Okay, so that means that I can sub in here by P would be equal to K times my dipole moment P. Maybe I'll put a little thing here to show that it's a big P, right? KP over R squared cosine of theta. So that gives me my electric potential at the point in question um, for the dipole. So that's our electric potential. Now we know that we can relate our electric potential to our electric field. Remember that the relationship for that was E is minus the gradient of phi. Okay, so the potential and the electric field are related to one another in, in this way. And so what we can do is we can take the gradient of our scalar potential there and find our electric field. Now in spherical coordinates, which is basically what I'm dealing with here, right? In spherical chords, the gradient of some random um, function f is going to be partial f with respect to r times r hat plus one upon r partial f with respect to theta theta hat plus one over r sine theta partial f with respect to phi phi hat so these are the spherical coordinates. And here the phi is not the potential phi, right? This is one reason why I don't like using phi for potential, but that's okay. We're copying Purcell and Moore and stuff here. So um, here uh, phi is the spherical coordinate, the angle, right? Okay, so um, what we're going to do, oh, by the way, if you need a reminder on these spherical coordinates um, shifting from calc three, you know, how what's a gradient and all that kind of stuff, um, those equations are given to you in the back cover of your textbook, uh, in the back cover of Purcell and Warren's textbook. And if you're not in this class and you need to check them out, you can check out any calculus uh, textbook and it should be in there, okay? All right, now um, in our expression that we have for our potential at the point P, you'll notice that we do not have any explicit dependence on phi because we are just looking at the projection in the plane 
in the XY plane. And so we're not really, you know, worried too much about that other coordinate. So um, what I'm going to do is ignore that and just find the electric field within the plane that I've drawn stuff here. So that means that my electric field is going to be minus the partial of my potential at point P with respect to R, R hat, and then plus one over R and the partial of my potential at point P with respect to theta, theta hat. Okay. Now finding these partial derivatives is um, pretty straightforward, right? The partial of my potential at point P with respect to R, remember I have that one over R squared dependence. And also remember that for partial um, derivatives, what I do is I treat every other variable like a constant while I'm taking that derivative. So the partial of phi with respect to R, I treat theta like a constant when I do that. So the um, partial of the potential at point P with respect to R would then give me minus 2KP over R cubed times cosine of theta. So that's what I've got there. And then the partial of my potential at point P with respect to theta, um, then I'm just taking the derivative of my cosine of theta, and that gives me minus KP over R squared sine of theta. Okay, so those are my partials. All right, now I'm going to plug those partials back into my equation here and end up with my electric field um, at the point, okay? So here, my electric field ends up being 2kp over r cubed cosine of theta, r hat, and then plus kp over r cubed sine of theta, theta hat. And that gives me my electric field. Now, what does this look like? Well, here's our positive charge. Here's our negative charge. We can draw what the electric field due to a um, dipole looks like. I'll just do a little sketch here. You can draw it for any point um, uh, P though, okay? So, but here's my sketch. Basically what happens is the following. Sorry if my electric field lines crossed. I never claimed to be a good artist. <laughs> Not my forte. But this is the general idea for what the electric field in a plane looks like, okay? Uh, the electric field lines make loops um, that come out of the positive charge and point in towards the negative charge there, okay? And so that gives us um, our general um, expansion terms there. And so that's our um, dipole for the field. Okay. Thanks a lot for your attention. See you in class.